Hello and welcome to this class. My name is Dr. Neil Sogi and this is the course Ancient History, History of the Ancient Near East and Ancient Greece. This is week two and the unit on the Akkadian Empire. Now, where have you heard this story before? A mother in distress. She bears a son, but doesn't know what to do with it. Out of desperation, she seals up a basket and places the baby in the basket. She then sets the basket afloat on the river. The baby is discovered by workers along the river. The baby grows up to become royalty. We've heard that story in the biblical story of Moses. But there's an older story. One that is perhaps even more powerful. And this story lends extra power to the biblical story for two reasons. One, culturally this was likely the best way to culturally transmit an orphan or unwanted child settle it along the busiest place in the community and hope someone takes it. In the ancient world, that was certainly the river. The second reason is that this more ancient story connects the story of a baby being set down the river in a basket with rightful rule of a people. So, this likely was used to give great extra weight to the power of the Moses story in the minds of the ancient Israelite peoples. Now, for some context. 12,000 years ago, humans transitioned from the hunter-gatherer societies to agriculture-based societies. Humans began to settle in ever larger communities and gradually created civilizations. Neolithic villages began to flourish in Mesopotamia after around 6000 BCE. And this is due to its rich soil and water resources with the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. The first civilizations that developed was the Sumerian. Many other civilizations would follow, including the Akkadian city-states, which would form to the north of the Sumerians. According to Akkadian legend, a woman of Akkad became pregnant, carrying the illegitimate child of a temple priest. Unable to keep the child, she was forced to set her son adrift in a basket on the Euphrates River where he was later found by a na man named Aki, a gardener for Ur-Zerbaba, Ur the king of the Sumerian city of Kish. Now this child would come to be Sargon of Akkad, also known as Sargon the Great. Now I want you to note something. Sargon literally means legitimate ruler. We don't know his birth name. We don't know the name that he grew up with. But he would grow to one day usurp the kingship of his own city of Agad, which would come to be the capital of his empire. After developing his Akkadian city of Agad and building a strong military, after around 2350 BCE, he began to conquer. And many city-states located around Mesopotamia were involved in trading and attempting to aid one another, which often led to conflict and war. Sargon used his army 
to bring these small conflicts to an end by conquering each Sumerian city-state, one by one. He was viewed as a, a talented administrator and a brilliant warrior. Sargon, according to what we can gather, was wise in going the, on the offensive against Sumerian city-states, conquering each, destroying all their defensive walls, as well as any enemy that would dare to stand up to him. His empire is thought to have included most of Mesopotamia and the surrounding regions, as well as doing some incursions into the Hurite and Elamite territories, making him the founder of the old Akkadian dynasty as well as the first Mesopotamian Empire. The old Akkadian dynasty ruled for about a century after his death. Until the Gudian conquest of Sumer. Now, historians believe that the Gudians were tribes of mountain people who combined with the revolting people of the various conquered cities, were responsible eventually for the downfall of the Akkadian Empire around 2150 BCE. Now, until Sargon's reign, Babylonian cities like Kish, and also Ur, and Uruk, and Uma functioned as independent city-states. They sometimes formed brief alliances with each other, and some cuneiform tablets attest to strategic marriages, celebrated and uh, considered part of developing relationships, as well as diplomatic gift exchanges. But mostly, they seem to have been at war with one another. Sargon first subdued Babylonia's fractious cities and then went on to conquer, or at least sack, lands like Elam in present-day Iran. He presided over his empire from the city of Akkad, the ruins of which are believed to lie south of Baghdad. It was written that daily 5,400 men ate at his presence, meaning presumably that he maintained a huge standing army. Eventually, Akkadian hegemony extended as far as Kavur plains in northeastern Syria an area prized for its grain production. Sargon came to be known as King of the World. Later, one of his descendants enlarged this title to King of the Four Corners of the Universe. And indeed, it seemed that Sargon did rule much of the known world for these people. Now, Akkadian rule was highly centralized and in that way anticipated the administrative logic of empires to come. The Akkadians levied taxes. They used the process to support a vast network of local bureaucrats. They introduced standardized weights and measures. They improved a uniform dating system under which each year was assigned the name of a major event that had recently occurred, 
For instance, the year that Sargon destroyed the city of Mari. And such was the level of systemization that even the shape and the layout of accounting tablets were imperially prescribed. So there was a standardization for accounting. Akkad's wealth was reflected in, among other things, its artwork, the refinement and naturalism of which was, for the most part, unprecedented. As the first emperor in history, Sargon of Akkad had much to brag about. Despite having no prior example to follow, as far as we can tell, he was able to take over and maintain Mesopotamia for over 50 years. He financed his empire by seizing control of trade routes, taking all goods that crossed through his realm, and this allowed his capital of Akkad, or Agad, to become the wealthiest and most powerful city in the world. He was able to maintain his empire by placing his best and most trusted men in positions of power in various cities. They would be appointed by Sargon himself to serve as governors and administrators in over 65 different cities. These leaders were referred to as citizens of Akkad in later Babylonian texts. Sometime, Sargon took over a city. It rapidly became an Akkadian stronghold, full of Akkadian officials and troops. And this stability throughout the empire allowed the construction of roads and economic coordination nation and cooperation, a wider influence of trade, improved irrigation, as well as development in the arts and in science. Sargon standardized weights and measures for trade and daily commerce. He also managed to initiate a system of taxation and created the first postal system. This guy did everything. And these various improvements to the lives of the people of Mesopotamia were not enough to prevent, unfortunately, the various conquered peoples from gathering to rebel against Sargon and his administration. Being forced to stay under the rule of an emperor who defeated various groups, taking their lands and goods, fueled the people to rebel. And eventually, this resentment caught up to the successors to Sargon the Great. By 2150, the Akkadian Empire had collapsed in the midst of rebellion from within, as well as from up with uh, outside invaders attempting to take the fertile land of Mesopotamia for themselves. But the story of Argon, Sargon losing the empire to inside rebellion is only one of many. When a group conquered when a group of conquered people are forced to live under another's rule, it's common for them to look for ways to strike back, overthrow those kings who attempt to rule over them. And later rulers would improve Sargon's administrative techniques by relying on centralized bureaucratic rule and regular taxation. Sargon created the very first political entity on a large scale and set the standards for all future rulers of empires. Through his unique upbringing, never meeting or knowing his parents, he was able to rise to power. This man was amazing. Initially, he was nothing. But he then became a king's cupbearer, probably more like a butler today, not expecting that he would one day conquer and maintain the land, but Sargon of Akkad would become the topic of legendary narratives in later Assyria. He was the archetype 
ruler. He was the archetype hero. He was profoundly amazing. Now, Sargon ruled supposedly for 56 years. He was succeeded by two sons who reigned for a total of 24 years. And then by a grandson, Naram Sin, who declared himself to be a god. Now, Naram Sin is where things start to go wrong. Naram Sin was, in turn, succeeded by his son. But suddenly, Akkad collapsed. During one three-year period, four men each briefly claimed the throne. Who was king? Who was not king? That was the question. The register known as the Sumerian King List asks, in what may be the first recorded instance of irony. Nobody was sure. Now, what we found is that there is something known as the Curse of Akkad, which was written within a century of the Empire's fall, and it attributes Akkad's demise to an outrage against the gods. Er apparently, the belief was that Naram Sin plundered the Temple of Enlil the god of wind and storms, who, in retaliation, decides to destroy both him and his people. This is how it reads. For the first time since cities were built and founded, the great agricultural tracts produced no grain. The inund inundation tracts produced no fish. The irrigation orchards produced neither syrup nor wine. The gathered clouds did not rain. Nothing grew. At that time, one shekel's worth of oil was only one half quart. One shekel's worth of grain was only one half quart. These sold at such prices in the market of all the cities. He who slept on the roof died on the roof. He who slept in the house had no burial. People were flailing at themselves from hunger. For many years, the events described in The Curse of a Cod were thought, like the details of Sargon's birth, to be purely fiction. Now, in 1978, after scanning a set of maps at Yale Sterling Memorial Library, a university archaeologist named Harvey Weiss sp spotted a promising-looking mound at the confluence of the two dry riverbeds in the Kabur Plains near the Iraqi border. He approached the Syrian government for permission to evacuate the... To, sorry, to excavate the mound, and, somewhat to his surprise, he was also almost immediately granted. granted. And soon he would, had uncovered a lost city, which in ancient times was known as Shekna, and what today we call Tel Lilin. After the, the next ten years, Weiss, working with a team of students and local laborers, proceeded to uncover an acropolis, a crowded residential neighborhood reached by paved road, and a large block of grain storage rooms. He found that the residents of Talilin had raised barley and several varieties of wheat, that they had used ox carts to transport their grain, crops, and that in their writing they had imitated the style of the more, their more sophisticated neighbors to the south. Like most cities in the region at the time, Tel Lilin had been rigidly organized. It had been a state-run economy. People received rations, so many liters of barley and so many of oil, based on 
how old they were and what kind of work they did. And from time to time, within the Akkadian Empire, thousands of similar potsherds were discovered, indicating that residents had received their rations in mass-produced one-liter vessels. After examining these and other artifacts, Weiss constructed a timeline of the city's history. From its origins as a small farming village around 5000 BCE, to its growth into an independent city of some 30,000 people in 2600 BCE, and on to its reorganization under imperial rule in 2300 BCE. Wherever Weiss and his team dug, they also encountered a layer of dirt that contained no signs of human habitation. And this layer, which was more than three feet deep, corresponded to the years between 2200 and 1900 BCE. And it indicated that at around the time of Akkad's fall, Tel Lilin had been completely abandoned. And in 1991, Weiss sent soil samples from Tel Lilin to the to a lab for an analysis, and the results showed that around the year 2200 BCE, even the city's earthworms had died out. Eventually, Weiss came to believe that the lifeless soil of Tel Lilin and the end of the Akkadian Empire were products of the same phenomenon, probably a profound drought so prolonged and so severe that, in his words, it represented an example of climate change and a catastrophic environmental collapse. Now, I'm going to just finish off this section by talking a little bit about the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh um, comes from this general region. Uh, the, the source material likely dates to around 2100 BCE, but the later versions that we have um, are mostly from 1300 to 1000 BCE. There's lots of different examples of this from uh, cultures throughout the region, region over the course of uh, hundreds of years. And uh, they vary a little bit, but I just want to kind of touch on some basics with this because uh, this gives us some insight into some themes that we see in the biblical literature as well. So the Epic of Gilgamesh is really an epic poem from the ancient Mesopotamian, and it's really regarded as one of the earliest surviving great works of literature. The story of Gilgamesh begins in a series of poems that tell of the king of Uruk that ruled in the region of Ur. So this would be in southern Mesopotamia. And these various stories seem to, to tell the story of this man Gilgamesh, king of Uruk, and in Kaidu, a wild man created by the gods to stop Gilgamesh from oppressing the people of Uruk. And after in Kaidu becomes civilized uh, through infatuation with a strange prostitute, he travels to Uruk where he challenges Gilgamesh to a test of strength. And Gilgamesh wins, and the two are so impressed with each other that they become fast friends. They then take a journey, and they uh, defeat a, a guardian no, known as Humbaba, and they... Uh, have other great battles and 
in the midst of these battles, in Kaidu, his friend dies. And in the midst of this despair, Gilgamesh is struggling with his own mortality, and so he desires to discover the secret of eternal life. And he's given some advice from a, a barmaid that basically says, don't worry about eternal life. Eternal life is for the gods. What you should do is focus on the little things, focus on the touch of your child's hand, and enjoy your work. Um, now, Gilgamesh was looking for the immortal man by the name of Utnapishtim, who was said to have survived the great flood. So there's a story of the great flood of Enlil, where the gods were annoyed by the people and sent this great flood. And Utnapishtim was loved by the god, by one of the gods, and told him, was told to build an ark. Now, in the midst of all of this, uh, Utnapishtim is all, or sorry, Gilgamesh is, is finds out uh, something of the source of eternal life and it's this plant in the ocean so he goes and he gets this plant but he falls asleep on the beach and this plant is then stolen as he's sleeping on the beach by a serpent and the serpent disappears with the this plant and so Gilgamesh is not able to live forever because of this serpent so we see in there I hope that you will recognize lots of similarities with uh, the biblical text. So there's likely a lot of source material that's overlapping there between the two. And then we have, as part of this, we have the Gilgamesh flood myth. And that is very similar to, there's other examples of these creation myths and these flood myths that come from Akkadian epics. Um, there's something known as the Atra Hassas tablets that have creation myths and flood myths. And there's also a surviving Babylonian deluge um, story, as well as stories of king lists of people that, who lived for a long time before the flood. All of these tie in very closely with um, what we know today from the biblical story of Noah and the flood. So just wanted you to be aware of the Epic of Gilgamesh and we of course will be talking about this more in class. Just remember that this is one of those great early epics that give us some insight into the background stories for creation myths and for struggles of mortality and immortality within the ancient world. And that's it for our lecture on the Akkadian Empire. I'll see you next week.